Hi, and welcome back to Nerd Moments. Today, I am chatting with the fantabulous Jason Lyle Black, who is an award-winning composer, concert pianist, and entertainer with over 30 million music video views, who has performed on The Ellen Show, and his new album, Piano Preludes, debuted number one on iTunes and number two on the Billboard music charts. Jason, how are you? Great. Thanks for having me on, Brittany. Hey, hey, I'm so excited to chat with you. You know, Jason and I met at an event the other day and um, had a fantastic conversation after that, and I just knew I had to get him on the podcast because I have I have not as of yet added a YouTube celebrity to my network, so I'm pretty excited to have you. <laughs> and, oh, I'm happy to be here. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to brag about how cool I am because I know you. <laughs> um, but so, Jason, um, tell tell the people who haven't the the three people in the universe who haven't seen one of your videos what what they're all about. So the videos that uh, that people know me by, and it's it's funny, you know, people may may not connect my name to the videos, but uh, particularly in in Utah, you know, where we live, but I mean, elsewhere, a lot of people have seen the videos. Um, the ones that got the most attention were these uh, family Disney viral videos that I made. So they had kind of a family theme and used um, very famous Disney songs. And so the first one was a, a skit of these two uh, dueling siblings playing Frozen. And that one made the Huffington Post. It made uh, Seventeen Magazine, made Good Morning America, and uh, did, in fact, it was actually on the television uh, show as well, not just their website. Um, wow. And uh, yeah, that video was just just very fun. I, I don't know, people connected with it a lot. And you know, there were pirated versions of that video that had even more views than the count uh, I gave you. But uh, you know, it's that one just reached millions of people around the world. And, and like I said, some of the versions that that were bootlegged from us, I think, and since taken down, had another ten or twenty million more views than than even the count that uh, that I, I can see publicly. Um, and then the other video was the. When I did with my actual grandparents, real life grandparents who have played the piano for over 60 years, they're in their mid 80s, and this was called Up in Real Life. And I basically I recreated the opening montage of Up that everybody loves with Carl and Ellie, and did that with my actual grandparents playing a piano duet to celebrate their anniversary. So that one, uh, literally every national news site or network I can think of featured it. It was on BuzzFeed, it was on MTV, People Magazine, Time Magazine's website, um, Good Morning America, Today Show, NBC, ABC, I mean, Yahoo, Huffington Post, everybody, uh, The Guardian, um, I mean, just every every news platform we can think of pretty much highlighted it. So it was really wow. fun to see that, and that has also reached uh, millions of people around the world. Um, many many millions and you know I got messages from people in various countries about that video and so yeah those are the two you know I, I have many other videos and um, various levels of virality but those are the two kind of mega mega videos that um, you know, millions of people worldwide have seen so when you got all that media attention for your videos was there anything that you did to kind of help that along or was that all just because the video went viral no, no, and they didn't wow. just uh, go viral either. That was all, those were two carefully, carefully crafted campaigns. Awesome. Very, yeah, very carefully designed. And they weren't my first attempt, uh, and actually weren't my first viral video either, but they were my first majorly viral video. So when I released Frozen in March 2015, that was actually the 70th YouTube video that I'd uploaded. So um, my story is very much one of, uh, you know, trying a million things and not necessarily getting what you want, but just not refusing to give up, I guess, because awesome. you still want to make it happen. Because I had, I was on YouTube years ago and just wasn't, things, you know, weren't really going the direction that I had hoped and, you know, I wasn't getting the virality. And I'd had a couple videos that had, had done, you know, somewhat well in that six years of dozens of other videos I'd uploaded. Um, but yeah, with Frozen, I kind of took a different approach and modeled after some uh, vi viral videos that I'd seen related to Frozen, related to Frozen that had done really well, and that's what kind of inspired the idea of this family theme and and the storyline and kind of the skit with it. So that was um, anyway the yeah the concept, the marketing planning began over New Year's at the uh, beginning of 2015, and um, we had a specific audience, we had a specific goal in mind with the video. The goal was actually to get back on the Ellen Show. Um, for me, which incidentally did not happen, but I did get on live television in Tokyo, Japan, so I wasn't too, uh, I wasn't crying too hard about that. Um, 
and thousands of people tweeted it to Ellen. I mean, thousands of people. We were able yeah. to measure that. So that, that part of the campaign was effective. But yeah, then I, I went through four iterations of that story. Um, it's writing kind of a little screenplay, if you will, for it, the, the story. And, um, and then, you know, worked, I did a couple iterations of the arrangement, the music. And then with Up, that one was about a three-month project from conception to release. And, um, and then both of these um, involved very specific social media marketing campaigns upon release. So uh, both of them had, we did Facebook advertising campaigns that helped launch the, the viral um, sharing of the video. And then um, I did a lot of uh, press seating and media outreach myself with both of them. To, and that's, that was actually, I mean, Huffington Post, 17 Magazine, um, Mashable, you know, a lot of those sites that picked the videos up um, either was a direct pitch for me or was because of another site that I had directly pitched it to. So, yeah, we, we did do all of the press seating and all that kind of stuff that goes into a viral campaign was a lot of work, a lot of work. That's fantastic. And I feel like a lot of people who are listening to this are going to wonder, you know, if, if, I'm, if I'm trying to do a similar thing, what, is, what does press seating look like for somebody who's brand new to it? Uh, it's well, and that's how I heard it called. Basically, you know, coming up with uh, a good story about your video that's very short, especially when it comes to online video. You know, a lot of the features for some of these videos were only a couple lines or maybe a paragraph at most that the, that they would say. Um, a few sites did articles, but others kept it very short. So having a good little pitch that you can share with um, blogs and writers and news sites and um, and you want to, you know, test that. You want to write it very effectively, track it, see what's working, um, and having a good headline. Having, I mean, that's and that's the thing. I've actually had more viral ideas since then that I've talked to people and said, "Oh yeah, that's a great viral idea." But if you can't develop a compelling enough news pitch with it, then it's not going to go viral. I mean, generally yeah. speaking. And so I have some ideas that are are temporarily shelved simply because. Though the content idea is funny, there's not enough of a news story to it, mm -hmm. and that's the thing that um, that really determines. You know, in this day and age, there's so much video content that to make something um, viral, a lot of the times it has to be really newsworthy. I guess I could backtrack on that a bit. So there's two types of ways I see things going viral. One is through the news. And so that's how mm -hmm. like the up video went viral largely. It actually went viral both ways. It went viral through the news. Which meant you know national media picked it up and that just like wildfire as soon as I got the first national media site to pick it up that I pitched to um, within another 24 to 48 hours dozens of other national news sites had picked up the story because they watch each other to see what's um, right. hot mm -hmm. but the separate way is something that's highly shareable so it doesn't necessarily have to be a news story so much as really really unique Mm -hmm. And so that's where, like, the Chewbacca mom, you know, that had so much fun with that mask yeah. that was a uh -huh. mass, one of those viral videos, I think, ever, actually, in terms of view count. That was just, that wasn't a news story. If she had created that video on her own and just sent it into a news site, they would have ignored it. But right. because it was funny and a bunch of people shared it, then it became, you know, viral, and then it actually became a news story in that sense. So there are there are a couple ways to to um, do that. But of course, as the social marketer knows, I mean, there's a tipping point to this kind of stuff and well, right. Malcolm Gladwell to getting things viral. And yeah. um, with Up, I happened to hit it in both points. With Frozen, we, we didn't have a ton of news on that. We had some, but it was really the sharing. Frozen, it was really more of it being a shareable video that uh, got the virality. Right, right. So when when you went to create these plans, I mean, where did these come from? Where did you even find find out who to who to contact about this stuff? Uh, so I actually, when I, in terms of marketing help, um, Celadora Studios, uh, my friend Eric Thane is at Celadora Studios, and they um, they do they're now exclusively a video kind of video marketing, but they were doing video and audio production, various things, and he he's kind of a viral guru um, and had quite a few videos do do well and get featured, so. I went to him, I actually worked with him, uh, well, his company on both videos in terms of the production, the video production. Mm -hmm. But he kind of helped point me in the right direction with things, actually helped run the first the, the first um, advertising campaign for the first video, and then I, I did the campaign on the second one. But um, 
and he was uh, consulted on the story with the second video as well. So that was, I mean, going to a, a studio like obviously Celadora was was great to work with. Um, Shareability is another one that that's uh, very very large brands. You know, they don't they don't take uh, typically under about six figure deals. I think typically you know with that company, but. There's a lot of um, obviously agencies from ver various sizes, from the smaller to the really really large, that can work with people on viral marketing and understanding the audience too. I guess because with the Frozen, really knew the audience was women with children at home um, mm -hmm. because we were trying to go after Ellen's audience, and that's the daytime Ellen's daytime television audience, and so right. that's why um, we did the video. That was what prompted the writing of that story the way it was, was to target that audience. And so that's important, um, obviously, with any marketing campaign, right, is understanding the audience that you're going after and connecting your content to that or else it kind of falls flat. Absolutely. Um, so for somebody who doesn't yet have access to, you know, hiring an agency, what's kind of like the DIY equivalent of a campaign like that? It's to literally do it yourself, um, which is which is what I did. I mean, I was I still had another day job that was uh, about sixty hours a week, average day job. So I would get home from that. Um, I used to work in the accounting profession. I was a CPA, and so I would be. It was that time of year, the tax season time of year. So I was in the office until about eleven o'clock, and then I would come home, and from eleven until two in the morning, I'd be pitching the video to. Um, news sites, sending out tweets, looking up editors, you know, who writes for this magazine, that magazine. I'd find them on Twitter and I'd create a tweet that was relevant to them. I didn't do any mass tweeting. That's kind of useless and can get you like spam issues too. Um, mass email. What's that? Sorry about that. Oh, ma mass, you know, mass emailing and forum letters and stuff like that. It's just people ignore that. But I, I created custom messages. So for each editor I was pitching to, I would look and see what do they talk about, you know, what are they interested in, and then I would customize just a quick little note to them about that, and, you know, hey, and respond to what they said about this other thing, and, you, you know, you might be interested in this video, and, awesome. yeah, I, I didn't have much actual specific training so much as just when one of my friends had explained to me that that was how videos often go viral, was through being sent to writers for media and you know now I do that as a regular thing I write when I have a news for the business I write a press release and we send it off to uh, different contacts and of course now I have a few existing relationships which that always helps but those all started with not having a relationship and you know reaching out to somebody and I think it's important too that whenever you do get someone who features your content whether it's your video or if you're advertising a something else blog post product whatever um, to maintain that relationship because that it's a lot easier to have an existing person you can just contact and say hey check out the new thing we've got that was one of the things that I think really helped the piano guys is once they'd had their first couple really viral videos is they had all of these news writers that were excited about their channel and so anytime they had a new video it was automatically news so it just mm -hmm. kind of snowballed they had a snowball effect to that yeah and you know one thing that I really like about your story is that you're you're really candid about the fact that it it these these viral sensation things always kind of seem like it's this big overnight success that comes out of nowhere. But what your story is, it's a story of a like hard work and perseverance, and that, I love that. And I love that you kept your day job. And you know, for for a lot of people out there who are just getting started, um, I was wondering if you could speak to that a little bit about what that looked like for you. And did you ever feel like you wanted to just give up? Yeah, and I actually did. I actually did. Um, give up for a couple of years. I actually did quit the business um, right. because it was it's so it was so discouraging. You know, I look back on those times. Um, I have you know it's 2016, and I started in music um, at at a essentially beginning professional level. And about 2004, really, was when I first started composing music that you know people would pay for, and um, concerts that people, you know, performing concerts that people would pay to attend. And obviously, it was very small, local, that kind of stuff back then. But at a at a you know, developing professional level, and so you know, in 2009, when I got started on YouTube, where I had already sort of been doing that for a few years, um, I expected things would grow quickly, and they right. they didn't. 
And, you know, a couple years later, as I've already been doing, you know, a lot of these videos, you know, along comes, well, it wasn't, it was actually about the same time, but I start seeing, you know, Lindsay Sterling and what she's doing. I was at BYU at the same time as her, as an undergrad student, and her videos, you know, were exploding. She was doing phenomenal videos with uh, Devin Graham that was shooting uh, her content, and of course, she'd been on America's Got Talent, and, you know, her story is the same way, though, where everyone thinks she was an overnight success, and, and there were so many years and years and years of hard work and discouragement that she had to overcome to get there. But right. for me, that was the thing as I saw, you know, well, why, why are my videos not getting successful? You know, I was getting yeah. maybe a thousand views on a video if I was you know, lucky as, as she has these videos getting millions of views. Right. And so it was very, very discouraging. And, and eventually in 2012, I, I quit making videos. And most, by the way, most of these early videos, a lot of them are now hidden from my channel just from a branding standpoint. It doesn't really reflect my my brand, but there are still a few of my earlier videos that people can see, you know, that I've, I've left up and kind of get a sense for the, the time I, you know, I went through and, and can see the, the challenge of, you know, without a budget, how do you create video content? And it is expensive. Um, yeah. it's, it's expensive to do and, and takes, that's why you kind of have to have a job that can fund it because <laughs> I, yeah. I was funding my own uh, channel. Um, but anyway, yeah, I think at the end of the day, um, you have to really, really believe in what you're doing because you're going to have to keep going after the odds are all against you and you're out of money and you're kind of tired of it. And what happened for me was, like I said, I did, I did retire from YouTube for a couple of years and I think in, I, I had been putting out monthly videos, I think, or every couple of weeks. And then I basically put out two videos in two years, I think it was mm -hmm. over a 24 year month period. So I basically quit vid doing videos. And what finally got me back was just this feeling like I, I have to, you know, for me personally, I have to do music. I have to be involved in this. And, mm -hmm. and actually, I got to the point where I just didn't care anymore whether my YouTube channel got big or not. Mm -hmm. I was just going to do it just because I felt that was important to me to do. And, that, um, and then I started saying, okay, well, let me take a step back and think about the marketing and how this could be done effectively. And, you know, that's when some things start to take off. And, I mean, there's more principles about how to be, you know, industry specific like obviously for music you know ways you can get more visibility on your youtube channel and that may be a little different for someone that's in say fashion or um right. you know the makeup channels which is a, a amazing business on youtube um but uh, and i think I, I guess another point i just want to make is to be realistic with the uh the expectations because i've so i went to a seminar with one of the um, he's one of the top YouTube marketers probably in the world. Um, I mean, it's certainly in, in the U S but he has worked with a, a lot of, uh, you know, multimillion dollar YouTube based brands and, um, the piano guys was one of his clients, um, studio C, which is another Utah based, um, very, very successful YouTube channel is another client of his. And anyway, he talked to us about some data that he had on YouTubers. And this is a guy that you know, regularly consults with YouTube as, as well on things. And he said that the average advertising revenue, I think as a percentage of a channel's actual business is like 7% of that wow. is ads. And a lot of people think, Oh, you're going to make a fortune, you know, on, on mm -hmm. ads. And it's not true. It's yeah. simply not true. won't. And I think he told us one video that he had been part of that I want to say had something like 20 million views or something like that. Um, had maybe made twenty thousand dollars or twenty five thousand, and for a lot of videos, that's not even your production cost. If you're a if you're a big brand, you spend over a hundred thousand producing a video, so yeah. your ad revenue doesn't really do anything. Where these channels are making a lot of money is from sponsorships. They get these big brand deals for sponsorships, product placements, product reviews, and then a lot of them sell products. And so, in the case of the piano guys, they're selling their tours. That's what their videos did is they drove people to sell out concert tours but you right. know piano guys don't just make videos they wouldn't that wouldn't cover their living because of the I mean because of how complex their videos are but what it does is it sells their shows which of course is a, a phenomenal business and it, for me it's kind of the same now I I don't make a you know YouTube doesn't doesn't pay anything for me in terms of my living but YouTube drives bookings in Japan Canada and the US it's, it's driven sales of my CD, my album, all of that kind of stuff. So that's how you have to have a, you know, entire, look at your entire business and see YouTube as part of that. Um, like I said, I mean, there, there are channels, YouTube channels that make millions of dollars, 
um, a year, but they're not making millions of dollars a year because of ad revenue. They're making millions because of all the other things that are part of their channel. Yeah, I'm so glad you brought that up, and that was actually a question that I was going to ask. Um, so I think that's a huge, huge misconception about you know going up there and being a YouTube celebrity. Is people think, oh, I'm going to make a million dollars, but you know I, I hear that over and over that that's really it's a vehicle to build your personal brand, but ultimately it's not a business in and of itself. And are there any industries in which that's not the case? I mean, are there any people you know who are just doing that and making a living off of it? Well, yeah, I mean, like I said, there are channels that are multi-million dollar companies, but mm -hmm. the point is it's not just making the video that causes it. What it is, is like I'll give you an example. I don't, I don't remember the name of the channel, but I, I believe they're, they're a seven to, or eight figure revenue channel per year, um, and they do toy reviews. Mm -hmm. And the reason that, and so the thing is, it, they're not making the money. F I mean, maybe they make money from ads on their channel too. I, I'm not sure, but it would it would be a very small percentage because I told you some of those numbers. I mean, it's really low ad revenue. What they're getting is, you know, if I'm a brand and I can go to a channel that has two million people who watch their videos, and those mm -hmm. two million people are parents of young children, and I have toys that are targeted to four year olds, then I'm going to be willing to pay fifty or a hundred thousand dollars for this channel to create you know, an ad or a couple ads, a couple videos about my toys because that's a more effective ROI than say going and buying maybe traditional television ads or something because I can target it, you know, in a social way through YouTube. And so that's the thing is they go to these channels and says review our, you know, review this awesome new toy we have and here's 50 grand. And so now, you know, you upload a video that maybe you only make $500 in ad revenue, but you made $50,000 in sponsorship for that video. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? Yeah, yeah. So um, that's so, and, and you know, and I'm I, I can't say in specifically what those channels' numbers are. I mean, I I hear about various channels that do this type of thing. There's a lot of channels that have paid product placements. I've even had it with my channel now. Um, but it's that's where your that's where your bigger money is coming. So you you could make videos full time as a living. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. You could be a full time YouTuber, but the money actually comes from having it. The things that you sell. It, it, it add that part of that business, if that makes sense. It's not that you just get ads and you make your living off of ads. Right, right. Um, you know, and I actually, I'm glad you brought that up. I have a friend who has a pretty successful cooking channel on YouTube, and she, she has told me that most of her revenue comes from sponsorships. Um, and so that's definitely something that she's pursued in her niche. Is that something that you've done any of or not really? Yeah, I, I, not a lot, but I have. Um, for me, my business goals, um, you know, my goal is, is to tour globally and, you know, play the major concert halls of the world and major music festivals. So mm -hmm. um, I'm not trying to become a, a digital content creator. Right. And so, you know, this model that we're talking about doesn't really fit. I mean, I could, you know, there's people that have music channels that upload, you know, all the time. But when you look at like the piano guys and Lindsey Sterling, for example, they're not, they're not uploading all the time because they're not digital content creators, they're live shows. That's, that's what the brand is that they're selling. And that's the same for me. You know, I'm, I'm now performing, as I said, internationally. And that's YouTube exists to drive bookings for me and to drive attendance at cons, to drive you know private and corporate bookings, and then to drive attendance at public shows. And so right. that uh, the sponsorships. I guess the reason that relates is to really do sponsorships effectively. Um, you have to be a regular content creator because. Right. The algorithm of YouTube and all these sites are set up that if you're not regularly releasing content, you're not going to reach your audience. They favor the channels that um, YouTube at least favors the channels that release regularly, like every day. Mm -hmm. And so these shows that create, you know, a daily talk show like uh, the Rhett and Link show, they they I mean it is it's a full time production company because they film right. new episodes just like Ellen or the Tonight Show. They film new episodes every day and you know, they have major sponsors. Like I saw Rhett and Link once, you know, their their episode was sponsored by Geico. So it's the same. It's actually the identical model as television. They're basically their own television show, mm -hmm. but the business is run like a television show because they right. sell ads to their advertisers. Right. They have to have that daily content, they have to have that level of production quality. Um, so yeah, it's, it's just, it's really interesting. I mean, the whole basement YouTube model, that's how it started. And, you know, I, I don't know, maybe some people would disagree and say that YouTube is still, a still, a you know, you can really see it as just a more level playing field 
of the entertainment industry generally where you could go try to become your own TV station or your own broadcast show and you don't need quite so much money and you have the distribution platform available to you but you have to take it seriously and realize that this is a you know that that was the thing my videos that got viral were not my videos where I sat with a tripod and did amazing things on the piano um, mm -hmm. those were my first 69 videos and the right. talent was there, but it wasn't showcasing it in a way that people wanted to see it. And it wasn't right. until I started, you know, up to my production quality and the screenplay. And it's not so much about how nice your camera is so much as just the quality of your content. And when I really improved the packaging of it, that's when it started to take off. Right. Um, so it, anything that you know now that you wish you'd known then about, you know, kind of lessons that you, you would have done starting out, you know, that somebody new starting out would appreciate knowing. <laughs> there's like, that's a terrible way to ask that. Do you know what I'm asking? Yeah, what do I wish? I mean, there's yeah. one instant thing that comes to mind is see what's new and be the first to jump on. Right. Um, I wish I had gotten, you know, more involved in YouTube earlier on because the fact of the matter is now, you know, the, like it's very difficult to explode on YouTube. In fact, mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of the majorly viral stuff we see is Facebook driven, like that Chewbacca mm -hmm. mom. That was Facebook, mm -hmm. not YouTube. Um, mm -hmm. It's very difficult because of the way, you know, content's changing. And, you know, Snapchat is the, if, as far as I understand, I don't, I, it's never been an app I could understand, but I guess it's like that, you know, mm -hmm. the biggest app everybody uses, right? And mm -hmm. I'm still an Instagram, Facebook person. I old school um, but you know you want to be in on the bigger the newer stuff and be in on it early because those are the people that quickly generate large followings when their site isn't overly saturated right. and I think that along with the fact that they had amazing content because they did but along with that that's one of the things that helped for the piano guys and Lindsay Sterling to both become as big as they were and I, I watched both of them closely during that time because I was actively trying to grow my own channel and they were really about the only independent artists or one of the few independent artists putting out professional grade music videos on YouTube now right. everybody puts out professional grade music videos not mm -hmm. like helicopters with pianos in the air but professional mm -hmm. quality you know music videos and that wasn't being done that back in 2010 and right. so that made them really unique. And so I, I guess to somebody, whether it's YouTube or something else where you're trying to use viral marketing, you need to be um, look for the platforms that are going to provide you with the best chance of reaching your audience because right. it's, it's eventually going to become saturated and be harder. Like again, Facebook marketing. Five years ago, a lot of major brands weren't doing Facebook ads, and now everybody's doing Facebook, and that's why our news feeds get so full of content we're not interested in because it's become more saturated. So if you were involved in Facebook in the earlier days, you had more chance to actually reach your audience, if that makes sense. Yeah, um, absolutely. So I and think that's, I think you that's a, big a really thing. important point, um, not just about the platforms, but I think about um, anything that's trending. I mean, I think that's really what you what you captured with your kind of Disney videos was that not just, you know, being on the right platform, but also, you know, kind of plugging into the things that people are already excited about. Yeah, and that's pretty much a cardinal rule for content discovery. Um, you know, when you look at my channel, my videos that are videos of songs people are already searching for. Mm -hmm. Those are the videos with over 100,000 views or over right. a million views. Right. And then my original content, those videos have like 10,000 views, mm -hmm. um, sometimes even Which less. Is still and, great. That's still you know, great that's, for most people. Well, and that's, and that's to be, but you know, I mean, I've got an audience, obviously a very large audience now, so for that it's, it is fairly small. But the mm -hmm. thing is that's to be expected because original right. content is, is not gonna be um, you know, as, as widely searched, but that's the whole point is if I had started with that original content, I couldn't have built the audience. But what I was right. able to do was build an audience using content people knew. And then when I went to release an album and this, I've seen, you know, time and time again, other YouTubers do this, then they go release an album and they now have an audience who will buy that album because they were discovered from the other stuff. Um, but the other point I just want to make it is kind of reemphasize what, you know, the, what I wish I'd known. I wish I'd understood sooner just the whole concept of connecting YouTube into your business because okay. I looked at it as I want to go viral because I want to be a successful musician. And that was about as detailed as it was. I spent, I mean, I spent countless hours for years trying to figure out how to go viral. 
literally all the time I was in college, instead of doing homework, I was trying to figure out how to go viral. I mean, I just, <laughs> that was what I wanted was to, to get that same virality that I saw Lindsay and the piano guys and these other groups do. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, nowhere along the line did I realize that, wait a second, you know, then what? Like, what is the ultimate goal right. of trying to be viral? Because the other yeah. thing I learned from this, this marketer was that some of the, some of the highest earning YouTube channels have pretty small followings because their mm. following is people who are paying for high rate of, you know, if you only have a thousand people watching your video, but those 1000 people bought your $500 training course, then you just made $500,000. Versus, right. you know, the musician who says, well, I need 5 million views and then you get 5 million views and suddenly it's like, well, now what? Did you have a yeah. show? You know, are you ready to go on tour? Uh, you know, are, were you encouraging people? And, and that's something that I now understand. Um, and I, it's, you know, now drives my, my overall business strategy and my, my so digital strategy, but I didn't get it at first. It, it took, right. you know, <laughs> going through these viral videos and then realizing, oh man, I, you know, I need to focus people on my show. And so now the videos that I do are, are, are generally driven more towards my show and the live performances or the album, but you know, wanting people to focus on one of those two things and not just say, Oh, that's a really fun video. I want to share it because that's great. I want it to drive them to a decision to book me or to purchase a ticket to a concert or to purchase an album. That's, and, and I just, I wish I'd understood that when I started. Yeah, that's awesome. And I think it's such a fantastic point. You know, I, and that was actually another thing I was going to ask is, you know, had you it to do over again, would you start with the YouTube thing still? Or do you feel like the other stuff should have come first? That is a really tough question. And I don't know, probably would have done them in tandem. I probably would yeah. have put more yeah, because on the one hand, you know, I wouldn't have a lot of the opportunities that I have now had I not been viral on YouTube. And so, you know, that opened up a lot of these types of things. But that said, some of the highest paid entertainers in the corporate entertaining world, for example, which is one of the worlds I'm, you know, primarily focused on, um, are people with no YouTube following. I mean, again, some of these you know, big, big entertainers, they're not household names at all. And so, uh, you know, the people who are selling out arenas, you know, like the Taylor Swifts of the world, obviously they're household names. But if I had understood that, you know, this, it's all part of a brand strategy, but if my business goal is to perform, you know, that should drive my focus. Um, it, it's really tough to say though, because on the other hand, again, I, I wouldn't have the chance to do the public concert series that I do. Like up in Canada was a community festival that I, I had lined up there, um, Southern Alberta. I would not have those types of opportunities if I had not been viral on YouTube because right. that's what creates demand for you and creates, you know, attachment to your brand. So I think, yeah, I think I would do a lot of things the same. Obviously, I just wish I had understood some of these lessons sooner. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, that's how every entrepreneur is. You right. realize that you could have accomplished in two years, what took you 10, if you had just known what you now know, yep. <laughs> when you started. Yeah. but you so, don't know what you don't know. So yeah. that's, yeah, that's how we learn. That's the serial entrepreneur, right? Cause you, yes. you realize that, well, next time I know what I'm doing. So this is going to work. Yes, indeed. Indeed. So, um, for somebody getting into, um, you know, whether it's a performer or just somebody who loves to create content, um, are there any kind of take-home messages you'd have for them as far as like, this is this is what it looks like now, this is how you get started now? Um, again, I think I just can't emphasize enough. Under, like, knowing what you want to do. Like, what is your end goal? Mm -hmm. and, and that's something that I just, when I talk to friends and they're telling me about what they want to do or or if people are asking me for advice and so often I don't think people really understand that they don't really understand. And I don't know if this is like a business thing generally or just something in the music industry or, or just in, you know, everywhere. <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, you, you ask people like, so, cause the question I always pose when someone, you know, when I'm having this kind of conversation with somebody is what is your perfect world look like in 10 or 15 years? If you're doing anything that you want to be doing, what does it look like? Because often we focus on like, well, this interests me right now or something. It's like, what would you really want to do? You know, for me, I mean, my, my perfect world would basically be to spend, you know, three months each summer touring the major cities of the world as a performer, 
um, taking my family on on tour and performing in Asia and South America and Australia and you know, Europe, um, even in Africa as well. And then, you know, the rest of the year, having a little bit more of a of an at-home life, but where I'm developing new material for my show and mentoring people, putting out some recordings, um, those types of things. But basically, I'd, I'd like to tour the world and um, perform in the major concert halls, be a, you know, a Vegas level act and um, essentially fill the shoes of uh, Victor Borga, who was the greatest piano comedian of um, the you know 1900s and sort of be the, the Victor Borga of now. So I have a very specific goal. Right. And so then when you have that specific goal, now you can make sure that what you're doing actually applies to that goal because in music, you know, there's so many types of opportunities you can do, for example. And this, this gets more, again, to kind of entrepreneurship. So I'll speak in – in the music industry, because that's what I, kn I know, but you could apply this to anything, like to the cooking show or to blogging or whatever. I could, you know, get paid to teach private piano lessons. I can get paid to work on, um, help somebody with their composition, to train them for competitions. I can get paid to transcribe people's music, um, to write it out in sheets. Mm -hmm. uh, I get paid to arrange other people's music and publish it. I could, you know, I get paid to, these are just things that somebody can, I'm not just me, like you can get paid to do in music. You can, you know, work on producing somebody's show. You can work on promoting it. You can help them with booking a show. You could work for a recording studio. Um, you could be a studio musician. Um, all of these are, just about all these are things that I've done in some fashion at some stage mm -hmm. of the last 12 years. Um, but what I realized is I need to cut those activities out that don't relate to my core goal. My core goal is to be able to sell, you know, 3000 tickets to venues like Bravano Hall or Carnegie Hall. And so mm -hmm. being a studio musician for somebody else's album, um, yeah, you can get paid, you know, for a session, but that just really doesn't align up with my long-term goals. And so I need to focus right. on making sure what I'm doing now is leading me to headline there because to headline one of these big concert halls, because the, there are many great studio musicians who make a great living doing that, but they're not headlining concert halls. They're playing backup keyboard on other people's records. And that's right. not what I want to do. Right. And so I think that's one of the most important things is for somebody to sit back and say like, can you actually describe, you know, 10 to 15 years from now, what are you going to be doing? And, and again, I just can't emphasize how often as I talk to somebody, they say, well, but I love this and I love that. It's like, well, that's good. But what do you want to do? And when you ask them to articulate that, it can be very, very difficult for somebody to, to actually understand what they want to do. They just see other, what other people are doing and say, well, that looks fun. And, and right. then, you know, but what do you want to do and what do you have the talent and skill set, you know, and, and drive and, and, and willingness to keep going when you want to give up, you know, yeah. to do. So mm -hmm. that's, that's probably one of the best things that, that I've learned. And, and it has changed my career. I, I have cut out a significant number of things that I used to do. I used to spend huge amounts of time creating sheet music because it's yeah. like, well, you know, I want to be a musician. But then, then I realized that the um, truth of the matter was that was not – you know, getting me where I want to go. And so it's great. You know, I still do a little bit of it and it's, I look at it more as a service because I provide um, music that people enjoy playing, but I, I don't really make any money at all from doing it. So it's more of a uh, giving back, I guess you could say doing sheet music, but, um, but yeah, I mean that way I'm, I focus my time now on, um, you know, live performances, which now has provided these opportunities as you know, I'll be touring, uh, just kind of the greater West area with I've got shows in Idaho and in Oregon and California and um, Utah and things that works in, in Arizona as well. And, um, that's now where I'm focusing my time because, and, and everything that, that we talk, we've talked about, I, it's all to drive um, my ultimate goals. So that's, and that's probably one of the best lessons that I have learned as an entrepreneur too, is just to stay focused on, on what you really want to do um, because that, yeah, that makes, that makes a big difference. <laughs> to right, not, not right. Get distracted. So, so for somebody who is kind of not really sure what to stop doing, they're just like, I, cause I encounter so many entrepreneurs who are just doing a million bajillion things. Um, how, how did you, how do you come, come to that kind of decision about, okay, this is, this isn't working for me. I'm going to stop doing this and start doing this. Uh, well, it starts with what we were just saying, understanding your end goal, and then you plan backwards from that. Right. 
That was something that a you know great uh, leader that I worked with kind of taught me about um, the concept of essentially planning backwards from where you want to be. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I used to be so frustrated that I never had enough time in the day for anything, and right. and so it was kind of funny because and I, I would go to these conventions and talk to my peers in the music business, and they tell me all the things they're doing, and it's like, man. I don't have time for that. I don't have time for that. And I was so frustrated. Everybody else has more time than me. A lot of them had, mm -hmm. you know, maybe a street team or, you know, a parent or spouse or somebody that was also, you know, working very, very heavily on their career, you know, some, some people. And it's like, I need, you know, I, I don't have someone in that position that can work full time on my career with me. I, I have mm -hmm. obviously assistants and, you know, consulting agent producer, that, that sort of role, but just not a full time. And so I actually, for a while, did bring on sort of an intern and, you know, part-time person to try to offload some of my stuff. But then what I realized was, you know, I need to do essentially an audit, if you will, of how I spend my time. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it's, that's an easy thing for me to understand because I used to be an auditor. <laughs> so, yeah. so I sort of stepped back and it's like, okay, what, what am I spending my time on right now? When I started looking at that, it was like, I'm spending a lot of my time on things that don't actually relate to where I need to go. So, for example... I realized that I was dedicating, unfortunately, way too big of a percentage of my time to donated gigs, mm. and it's great. And I, you know, I want to. I, I, it's it's fundamental to my career and life goals to give back to the community. But no business can survive when forty percent or thirty percent of its time is spent on things that do not earn revenue. Right. That's impossible. Right. You know, most companies maybe at most, I mean, the companies that give a ton back are doing five to 10% of their revenue back. Like, you know, those companies where you buy a shoe and give a shoe to somebody in another country, right. like mm -hmm. tops 10%. And so I made that decision to say, okay. Um, and I, I actually had to, you know, go to a couple organizations that are people I talked to and say, you know, I think let's find another person that you can work with that's going to be a, a better fit and at a stage of their career where this will be a, the right thing for them because I have to scale back. So I still have, I mean, this year I'll have had a, a, a number of benefit concerts that I have done, but I cut that back um, from mm -hmm. what it could have been. So that oh, was and one. I, think, I didn't, you know. Yeah. Go ahead. I, I think that's relevant for people in a bunch of different industries because I think a lot of new business owners um, get roped into this, like, I'll work for free because I'll take anything sort of thing. And it's a great way to get started and it's a great way to get your foot in the door. So I, I love that you offer that as an option for people you know who are trying to get, get started. But I think it really, like anything else, is just a timing thing. It, yeah, it is. It's a tiny thing. And then, yep, and, and that's where I look at it. I mean, there are people, you know, the, the people that are above me in the entertainment industry, those that I look to as, you know, role models and coaches, um, you know, some of these folks are, are, you know, very high fee ranges, you know, five-figure um, fees uh, for their performances. And, you know, they still get approached by people for, you know, these small-dollar gigs, um, and, you know, under $10,000 gigs. And so, you know, they'll say, well, I've, you know, why don't you call Jason and, and do that? And, you know, someday uh, I may be the, you know, be that person that passes those on as well. And, and so there is kind of, I mean, a niceness in the sense to this sort of food chain that as your business grows, you, you get to the point where you should recognize what work you need to say no to. And, and that is one of the things, having the courage to say no to work that doesn't value your, doesn't build your brand. That's difficult, mm -hmm. but again, I have turned down stuff that was paid work at a time when I needed money because the work was did not line up enough with the brand, and it's a distraction. So it's like, yeah, I may be able to make you know a few hundred dollars helping on this side project, but this project does not relate to my goals. And if I take this you know little client project on, then I'm not out there finding the big client that matches up with what I want to do. Um, and that's scary. And that's, and I've talked, in fact, just the other week, I had a conversation with another, um, at one of the events, you know, that we'd met at and had a conversation with another business owner who said, I just, I just can't turn that away right now. And, you know, she's taking on clients that are, are only making, you know, just, I mean, pennies on the dollar compared to the clients that she wants because like, well, I need the money. And it's like, but if, you know, if you could step away from that, then you kind of legitimize that your brand really is a higher order you know, that your client level is, is a step up and then you're going to find those people. And, and that's the value of still having a day job for the, the right amount of time is so that you're not so desperate that you'll take anything because if you'll take anything, then you won't really get anywhere. Um, 
again, I mean, this was advice that was first given to me years ago by uh, an entertainer who said, he's like, you know, the only way he got his fee to the level it's at now was by turning down stuff lower. And he said, I know people that would never turn down the fees I've turned down. And he's mm -hmm. like, but that's why their fees aren't at my, you know, my level because they weren't willing to walk away from business that didn't line up with their, their brand. And so they're stuck. They're stuck in the, the low hanging fruit. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah, I mean, it's, there's, there's a lot of little things. Obviously the benefit concerts for me, another thing that I stepped away from was, um, over worrying about, you know, how complex my social media strategy needed to be. I used to spend you know, so much time and everybody said, well, you gotta be posting more to Facebook and all this stuff. And then I realized that I could have, you know, just a couple simple posts a week. And, you know, that obviously that varies by industry and that some people need to post much more frequently. But you know, for me, that worked just fine. And now I don't feel so overwhelmed. And I have templates. So I don't have to reinvent, you know, be organized and have, have introduce efficiencies. I, I actually do regular email marketing now. Every three weeks, a message goes out every two to three weeks. And it only takes me... 20 minutes to send a message and before it was like I was reinventing the wheel every time and it took three hours and so mm -hmm. simplifying like trying to find ways that you don't have to be a perfectionist in it and just say you know what 95% job done is better than nothing and if you're always having to get it you know the perfect perfect hundred percent you'll probably never get anything done and that was I think another thing that held me back was everything had to be perfect all of my my website had to be perfect and my designs had to be perfect and so I never got anything done because everything took so long that I could never finish anything I set out to do mm -hmm. um, and as an entrepreneur you literally have to wear every hat and so now I you know it's okay I, oh man I missed a typo in my you know email marketing that went out well that's too bad you know right. <laughs> my, right. my business is probably gonna fail because I didn't spend an extra <laughs> you know 15 minutes proofreading my uh, my email really carefully yes um, absolutely thank you so much for sharing so. that and you know, Jason, we, we need to wrap up, but before we do, is there anything else that we haven't touched on that you want to really kind of leave out there as like your take home message for, for people out there who want to do what you've done? Uh, just don't, don't give up. Um, if you're, if you're absolutely sure of, you know, where you want and think you can go, then, then don't give up. And if you're not sure, then go figure it out because it's going to be a long road to get there. So, yeah. Uh, but yeah, no, I appreciate the chance to to be on your podcast and, and to get to talk about it. Yeah, this has been awesome. Thank you so much for being willing to share. And Jason, I, I see big things in your future. I know that I and everyone else who's listening is going to be really excited to see what you come up with next. What, what can we expect uh, to see from you next and where can we find it? Well, uh, the next, next five years, you know, is going to be, I mean, more videos, a lot of touring. Um, you know, people can, can follow me on my website, uh, jasonlyleblack.com. That's Lyle, L-Y-L-E. Mm -hmm. um, also, of course, on every social platform except Snapchat, because like I said, I haven't figured that one out yet. But uh, Facebook and Instagram. Yeah. Um, I do have a text marketing as well. So people can text my middle name, Lyle, to 444-999, that number, uh, to 444-999. And they'll get awesome. updates on my email or my music that way. Um, but yeah, I've got a lot of concerts coming up, and and again, in the next five years, I'm I'm looking to to go to Europe and be back to Asia as well for more performances. Went to Canada this year, first time. So, just a lot of fun things in the works, and um, you know, my my music can be heard all over Pandora, Spotify, iTunes. So, check me out there, and uh, you know, listen to my my music as well. That's fantastic, Jason. Well, it's been great talking to you. This has been a nerd moment, and you all stay nerdy, and we'll see you next time.